So let's hear it for Matt and Becky and the home team. And I also want to welcome back Gordon. It's good to see you. Welcome. Yay. <laughs> so we're into, we're into baseball season, but we're also heading into Holy Week. Next week is Palm Sunday, followed by uh, Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, and then Easter. And I invite you to come to our Maundy Thursday service. Uh, we are actually combining the night that Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane with Good Friday, since it's hard to park and get down here on Good Friday, so we're going to combine the two. And um, we have a candle lighting service, a communion service, and Andrea Carino is going to uh, play uh, crystal bowls in the chapel, and that's going to be your tomb. So you're going to walk out of here and sit in the tomb and be blessed with these crystal uh, bowls. So it's, it's, uh, it's quite fun, and it's it's one of the times that we get to really move around the church and have kind of an experiential and very sacred service. So put it on your calendar. So Jesus in his ministry, the whole thing is starting to come to an end. And what's happening is that he's becoming more vocal. He's becoming more public in his ministry. And of course, next week sort of is the pinnacle of his uh, public persona that he uh, shares. Because in the past, in, the, in his ministry over the three years that he's had it, he does healings and he does all kinds of things, but when the crowd starts looking for him, he's gone. It's like he just disappears and they can't find him. And now he's just kind of coming out more and more and he's, he's more willing to be seen. And so this, during this week, he becomes even more and more visible and that is because his friend Lazarus is sick. And he gets word that Lazarus is sick and he's teaching and healing and they're like, you have to come now because Lazarus is very sick. Well, he says, I'll be there as soon as I can, but he've got stuff to do. Meanwhile, Lazarus dies, and uh, Lazarus' family, Martha and Mary, are not too happy with Jesus for dragging his feet and taking his time. So I want to back up a little bit, because in any good story or in any good movie, there is always a foreshadowing of events. I took a screenwriting course, like back in the 90s, and, you know, in the, at the end of your play, you have to have something really big happen, which I did, and then my teacher said, well, you can't just have that happen. And I said, why not? He goes, because you didn't foreshadow it. You didn't, you didn't let the audience know that it was coming. And I was like, well, how do you do that? So um, if you look at some of, it's in every film, it's in every story. So for instance, remember Jurassic Park, right? That's one we've probably all seen. And in the front, in the beginning scene, when Dr. Grant is coming into the island on the helicopter, the helicopter uh, hits turbulence and drops. And so he doesn't, he doesn't have a seatbelt on and everybody else puts their seatbelt on and Dr. Grant grabs the seatbelt, but he has uh, the two female ends of the buckle. So he ends up tying it around himself instead. Now, while the scene is meant to be a comedic moment, it actually foreshadows that all the dinosaurs on the island are female, but manage to make it work and reproduce us as it, life finds a way, right? And if you remember the Titanic, when Rose wants to jump off the, the boat, right? She's ready to jump and she's talked out of it by Jack. And then it's foreshadowing at the end of the film, she's in the same exact spot, only now she really does have to jump. And Lee, what's reversed is she didn't want to live and now she does. So the raising of Lazarus is a foreshadowing of the bigger event that's going to happen in a couple of weeks of Jesus' resurrection. So it's almost like we're getting the story or part of the story before the real story pops up. So here's the scripture. It's in John 11. So Jesus, he obviously, he arrives uh, too late. And they're like, you know, you're too late. Lazarus is dead. Thank you very much. And Jesus says take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of the dead man, she said, Lord, you know, already there's a stench because he's been dead for four days. And Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus looked upward and he said, Father, I thank you 
for having heard me. Now what's interesting about this is this is exactly the same process, more or less, that he uses when he's feeding the 5,000, right? There's not enough, and he says, Father, I, I, I give thanks, and I know that you hear me always. So there's this there's always this teaching moment of how do we pray? How do we pray? We know that the Spirit of God is always there. He said, I know that you always hear me, but I've said this for the sake of the crowd so that they may believe that you sent me. And when he said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said, unbind him and let him go. So we have the raising of Lazarus. And, men, and this story has many of the same elements that the Easter story does, right? There's a stone that must be removed from the tomb. Um, Jesus publicly calls him back. And like the Easter story, this story tells us that we can resurrect any dead condition in our life. Because when we look at this story metaphysically, we are all parts of this story. We are Lazarus. We are the stone. We are the, the Christ or the I am, the higher self that's calling us out of any dead condition that we may have experienced. And this story is telling us that nothing is too rotten and it's, nothing is too far gone and it's never too late to wake up, ever, no matter how rotten things may be. <laughs> now, we've been reviewing some of the 12 powers from the past years, and faith is the one that we've been focusing on in the last couple of week, weeks. And I believe that faith is the power that removes all the stones and blocks in our way, because when we have faith, when we can see it doesn't matter how we get there, we know that it'll happen. That's the power of faith. It's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So faith is the power that re can restore life to our dreams, to our body, to our finances, to our relationships. And we know that it's never too late for the Christ, for the Spirit, for the I Am to call us back to life. Because like Becky saying. There is always something calling us to more. Yeah? So I think this story also points out that there is a tendency sometimes to lose ourselves. Right? Anybody ever felt like you've lost yourself, you know? And I, I actually have a list of all the different ways that we could lose ourselves. <laughs> I research this stuff. Sandra Puala said, here are some of the ways that we can lose ourselves. A relationship, an unfulfilling job, family members, children, marriage, friends, uh, strong emotions like worry, fear, desire, obsession, depression, change in life transitions, a move to a new place, an accident, surgery, over-focusing on others, a major project, childhood experiences, trauma, combat, loss, putting on a happy face, living a lie, getting stuck in a role. So that pretty much covers it all, don't you think? <laughs> and it's true, it is the dance of life, because I think life is a series of, of forgetting and remembering, remembering and forgetting, and it's the dance of life because we're actually called here to serve. We're actually called to give ourselves over to each other and to our children and to our parents and to different relationships, but we can get lost, can we not, if we're caring for an elderly parent or a sick relative? We can get lost when we're raising our children. We can get lost in our career. We can get lost in a relationship or recovering from an illness. All of these things are very big. When I was at the uh, airport flying home from L.A., I was talking to a woman and explained that I was visiting my son. And she goes, oh, it must be hard. He lives in another state. I go, yeah, you know, but it is what it is. And she said, well, I have three kids. I still have two at home. One's in college, but he you know, comes over a couple days a week for dinner and to do his laundry, and, and he's still too far away for me. You know, I just soon he live with me forever. And I said, it's true, but, you know, when we're doing our job right, then they go and they get their own lives. And, and, it's, it, it, and, and it's interesting being a parent because, you know, they consume every moment and every thought and all your finances, and then one day they just leave. They're just gone, you know. Um, and... 
it's, and then there's that process of reclaiming oneself. I remember when my children went, moved and went off to college, uh, a, a friend of mine came to me and she said, now, you know all that nurturing energy that you poured into your kids? Well, guess what? Now you get to pour it into yourself, you know? So, um, so there's that whole experience of reclaiming oneself. Stephanie Paula said, uh, you suddenly, sometimes you suddenly wake up and you realize that you don't know who you are. You feel empty. You don't even like yourself. You feel like running away. You want your real self back, but who is it anyway? The lost parts of yourself need to be remembered, reclaimed, embraced, and nourished fully in order to sprout and grow. So, again, there are so many different ways um, trauma and illness that can cause you to have an out-of-body experience. The, Ch in Ch the Chinese tradition says that if we receive a severe shock, sometimes it feels like the soul can leave the body. And so like Lazarus, um, who is dead too long, it is not too late. So think about the times that you may have lost yourself, for whatever reason that may be, and how did you get yourself back? Because you got yourself back. It's just a process that we do. And what is it for you that works? Because what works for you may not work for me and vice versa. Obviously, meditation and silence, prayer is a way to reconnect with our, with our soul and with ourself. Right? We are threefold beings. We are spirit, soul, and body. And how do we reclaim that soul which is the core of us? Um, you know, one of the ways for me is... I, I go back to Chicago. I don't know what it is about Chicago, but I feel like I put my soul on straight when I'm there. I don't want to live there anymore, but I need to go back at least once a year to just sort of align myself. Do you have a place like that? Is there a place in your life that helps you to put your soul on straight? Um, another way to reclaim the self, which may sound kind of weird, but is if you're feeling, if you're feeling out of sorts and disconnected, get a mirror and just look at yourself in your eyes. Now, it's a bit challenging to do that sometimes because the first thing you might go is look at all the lines and all the flaws and, oh my God, look how I've aged. But if you stay with it and simply stare at your own eyes, an interesting thing begins to happen and it's like there's an alignment that starts to take place and you see these, these eyes that have been with you, obviously, from the moment you were born which is a reflection of the soul, you can feel it and see it start to come forward. And you can feel an alignment that begins to happen within yourself. I think it's so interesting how our eyes kind of stay the same, even though the rest of us might change. I remember when my mom died and all these people, and, and my dad both, but they all, in Chicago, it's everybody goes to everybody's funeral. It's part of like the social fabric of, the world there. And I, and I remember people would come up to me and I'd have no idea who they were. And then, and, and they would go, hi, Karen. And I'd be like, hi. And it was very interesting because then they would come up to me and they'd stick their eyes right in my eyes and I'd look and go, oh, it's my cousin Margie. Oh my God. I haven't seen Margie for 20 or 30 years and she doesn't look like Margie at all, but she does in her eyes. And I realized that, the, that pretty much that whole time that if I stopped and I went nose to nose with somebody right in their eyeball, I could see who they were because that didn't change because there's a reflection of the soul that exists. So how is it that you reclaim yourself? And is there a part of you that you might feel is a bit lost to you right now? Because the presence of God, the I am, the Christ, says, come forth, come out. So I'd like us to actually take a moment to have a, a bit of a meditation to kind of just anchor this in. So I invite you, if you would, to just sort of put aside anything that might be in your hands and just go with me on this journey for a minute. When have you felt the most like yourself? 
Maybe you were a child. Maybe it's today. Maybe it was last year or, or right now in this moment. But when have you felt the most like yourself? Just feel that. Breathe that. What were you doing? What was it about that that made you feel so connected? And now stepping back from that, I invite you to just reflect on the roles that you've played in your life. Your career, how you show up there. As a husband or a wife, as a parent, and were you, did you ever get lost in any of those roles? And if so, how did you regain your sense of self? Coming into the present moment, what about now? How are you feeling right now in this moment? Is there any part of your life, is there any part of you that has become like Lazarus? Is there anything in you that needs to be brought back from the dead? Perhaps the stone that is in front of this tomb that is holding you was put there to protect you. But I invite you in your mind's eye to roll away the stone. And we say to that part, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus, come out. and speaking your own name silently, come out. And imagine your soul rising to this moment, stepping out and rising into your true, complete, and clear self. Lazarus, come out. And what is one action step that you can take to show or to anchor this lost part of yourself and have it anchored back in? And then when you're ready, just come and open your eyes. So this is a process of life where we forget and then we remember and we forget and we remember. We we lose ourselves, we reclaim ourselves, and every time we reclaim ourselves, we're deeper, we're different, we're more textured, we're more colorful, we're more experienced and deeper. So this experience of waking up the different parts of ourselves is a foreshadowing It's a foreshadowing to the bigger event that is happening in a couple of weeks, which is the full and complete resurrection of our lives, of our spirits, and of our souls. So recognizing that we're all parts of the story. You're Lazarus. You're the Christ. You're the stone. You're the tomb. And no matter what the condition, no matter what the situation, it can be resurrected and risen And it's never too late. So I invite you this week to look at those parts of yourself that you may have let go of and call them back in. Bless you.